Welcome to Vision Chats, where the only thing that matters is the future. I am Farooq Day, Vice Provost at Johns Hopkins University, and it is my honor to be with you today and to be with a special guest, Jamie Marisodis, uh, who is the founder and uh, CEO of the Lumina Foundation. Jamie, you've uh, had your, you've been working in uh, um, higher in higher education circles and future of work circles. Before Lumina Foundation, you were the founder and CEO of the Institute of Higher Education Policy. You're the author of two amazing war, uh, books, Human Work and America Needs Talent. And uh, I've watched so many of your videos. You and I served on a panel before. You have uh, uh, a well of knowledge of, uh, in these issues, and I can't wait to dig in. And um, I want to start first by uh, uh, having a conversation about the radical changes that either are happening now, but especially that we need to, to make in our um, workforce and in our uh, workplaces as we start uh, coming back from this long uh, pandemic, go- coming back to a new normal that we'll create. So I'd love to get started there and uh, have a, a, a great conversation with you today. So what hey, are your thoughts you. about this? And you've written about those. Yeah, thank you, Farouk. And thank you. Great to see you and to be with you. And and um, I just love this format. I'm, I'm looking forward to our to our conversation. You know, I I am I, I probably want to start by saying, you know, th- this your your description of me is very accurate, right? Because this is what I've always done, right? My life has been about this intersection between higher education and work, and what we're dealing with right now in uh, the emergence from from whatever uh, we've dealt with in the last year with COVID and uh, the reckoning around racial injustice and the economic challenges that we've faced and the ongoing issues that we're, we're focusing on. I've always dealt with this intersection between, between higher education and, and work and, and thinking about how that plays out um, in the context of what's gonna happen post COVID when it comes to work is really interesting because you know, people have asked me, I'm the president of Lumina Foundation, you know, largest foundation in the country focused on post high school learning People keep asking me, so so what will education do in response to to this to this world? And it's one of the reasons, ironically, why I wrote the book, uh, the recent book on, on human work, is that part of my question is education's got to prepare people for the work that only humans can do. Mm-hmm. And I think what we've seen in the um, in, in the a pandemic is an acceleration of those trends, right? So automation, AI, technology taking over more and more of the tasks that people used to do. Uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell gave a speech recently in which he said, we can expect work to accelerate in terms of its change because of technology, and I'm not sure we're prepared for it. Uh, You know, we can, um, you know, but we were thinking about these things before COVID. We were We were focused on racial injustice and inequity before COVID. Now all of these things are being accelerated. And I think one of the things that we're really going to need to focus on is this fundamental question. What are we good at as humans? And what are machines good at? And, you know, we've spent a lot of time, you know, reading these scary stories about technology and AI, and, you know, maybe we're not gonna have any work to do and the robots are gonna take our jobs or whatever. But at the end of the day, I think we should recognize that machines are good at a lot of things. They're good at repetition and speed and pattern. Um, they're good at reducing things to an algorithm. Uh, but machines, as, as uh, 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 the roboticist uh, Ken Goldberg told me, machines can't understand, understand subtlety. They don't understand um, you know, nuance, how people react to each other. And so uh, this post-COVID environment or this new normal that we're dealing with is gonna to have to focus on this idea that humans and machines are complementary. What humans are good at is complementary to what machines can do and vice versa. And I think that complementarity sort of takes us down this path of understanding what work is going to look like because before COVID, we of course had people working remotely. We will have more people working remotely as a result of COVID, but you will also have people go back to the traditional work that they experienced before COVID. You will have the work that people never left in COVID because they couldn't work remotely change because of what happened in COVID. Work environments are changing. Um, The application of technology in work is changing because of social distancing, those kinds of things. But I think what you're gonna see mostly is a big change in the middle, Farouk. What you're gonna see 
is a lot of hybrid work environments where technology is going to be used more and our human traits and capabilities, our empathy, our ethics, our ability to be uh, collaborative, to, be, um, to, to, to communicate with each other interpersonally, those are the things that we're going to have to develop as human workers to complement what's happening with the technology. So I, you know, I'm, I, you've, you've read my book, I'm an optimist. I continue to be optimistic even after COVID because I believe that uh, the future of human work is exciting um, it will require us, however, to prepare for that future of human work. That's what I think we really need to be urgent about as we emerge from this pandemic. It, it feels to me that there is a struggle right now as we are coming to the back end of this pandemic and we're starting to see the um, uh, the coming back signs. There's a struggle right now in the workforce about maintaining what was before COVID-19 and trying to imagine what will be, but I think maybe a risk aversion or something else is keeping us from really making a commitment for what that future will be. Um, what you are discussing, either a hybrid approach, there is a good part of the workforce that uh, might be remote, uh, but also I think what, what I'm hearing in the back end is um, a desire to want to go back to the water cooler culture uh, in the workplace that uh, uh, the, the, to maintain the vibrancy of the workplace. But also, I mean, I think that there is a real issue around this is that for every workplace, there is a community around it. There are restaurants and there are gas stations and there's an economy that depends on that workforce. So if most of it um, stays home after the pandemic, this is going to have a detrimental impact on uh, the local economies. Um, how do we balance all of this out as we try to imagine um, a future of working remotely versus working um, in person, uh, just how we were or, or creating some type of hybrid approach? Yeah, there's several wonderful things that you've just said in there. So I wanna pull out a few things because I think you're, you're really right about so much of this. You know, the, the starting place for me is Look, at the end of the day, technology has always stayed ahead of human skills, right? That part of what's happened in work is that technology changes. And so then we have to change, we have to adapt to what the technology can do and advance our human skills. So in the race between technology and human skills, technology has stayed a step ahead. That is not bad for humans, right? Because we can develop our human traits and capabilities in new and different ways to respond to what the machines can do because again, they're faster or they can do the things that are less safe for humans or, or what have you. But you know, as we think about this uh, world that we are, we are entering, we have to remember that, think about what happened, Farouk, at the height of, of COVID when we were mostly locked out of in-person um, experiences, many of us, people like you and I, um, mm -hmm. in terms of working. Who were those workers? Overwhelmingly, those remote workers were people with college degrees. They were people that had the ability to do that work remotely. In fact, at the height of the pandemic, more than 50% of people with bachelor's degrees in the United States were working remotely compared to less than 10% of people with a high school credential or less. So there's a huge disparity in terms of how we are developing these human traits and capabilities through higher education and then what you can do in terms of that work. So one important outcome of this is we need more and better higher education and we need to make sure that we are focusing particularly on equity as, as part of that, of that education. But the second is what are we preparing people for? And I think this gets to your water cooler point, which is that you know, as human workers, we um, not only want to make money, uh, to be clear, our earning a paycheck is very important, right? Like that, that's very important. But what we want is meaning and purpose and dignity. And at the end of the day, the thing that distinguishes us most from the machines is that work matters to us. And it matters in ways that are not just about what that job is, but also because it gives us our social mobility. It has meaning, it has purpose, it gives us dignity. And when you don't have that in-person uh, connection, at least part of your work life, you miss out on that meaning and purpose. So finding ways in which we can, again, achieve that human machine complementarity, take advantage of the technology, but enhance 
the human interaction and when we are together, really take advantage of that, I think is hugely important. Not only because it, it has an impact on those communities and those local businesses that you were talking about, but also because at the end of the day, it's what we want as humans. Uh, you know, I, I describe this as the virtuous cycle of learning, earning, and serving others. That to me is what human work is all about. And, uh, you know, machines don't have a desire or motivation to serve others. We do as, as humans. And that desire to serve others, at least in part, has to be met by real human interaction. And so, you know, I think that we, we will see work change. We will see jobs lost, jobs destroyed, but we'll see new jobs created, new opportunities created because of technology. You know, that's the side of optimism. If we develop our human talent, if we develop it and, and enhance you know, our ability to be ethical, our ability to work in teams, our ability uh, to, be, to be more empathetic to our, to our fellow human beings. To me, that's the intersection, the nexus between what happens in education and what will be happening in terms of the world of work. In fact, the World Economic Forum uh, predicts that there will be 85 million jobs lost in the next five years, but 97 million jobs created in the in, in the same time span. Um, it, the report also predicts that um, uh, 50% of the employee um, population of employees will have to reskill or upskill within the next five years by 2025, um, uh, four years that is. Um, so this puts tremendous pressure on um, education circles, higher education, universities, community colleges, private, public, uh, but also potentially uh, for-profit education uh, to um, uh, play a role in this. Um, and I, I know from your days of uh, being at the Institute of Higher Education Policy, but also the work that you do now at the Lumina Foundation, um, you think about these issues a lot. And I can tell you just from a higher education perspective, we're thinking about it a lot also is the idea of uh, uh, the skills of what our graduates need to have in addition to the knowledge that they need to acquire and then also to become productive um, citizens of the world. Um, what are you seeing here in terms of shifts? We're all trying to read the winds here. See, where, where is this headed for um, education and higher education? Yeah, you know, I think there's several things that we've got to focus on. And again, these are things that we saw before COVID that I think have accelerated. You pointed out one, which is the global demand for skills and the emergence of human work is going to accelerate and it's going to place enormous pressure on the way we prepare people for work. By the way, the way we prepare people for the rest of their lives too, right? Because, you know, uh, we, we, we are in this ongoing cycle, as I said, of learning that that's really important. So, you know, to me, we need to understand how human work is different and figuring out how we adapt our learning systems to that. We have spent, in my opinion, Farouk, too much time in education trying to distinguish between what we do in education and what happens in what people call training. And um, so, uh, you know, the uh, you know the the sort of of um, a simple way to describe this is that you know what we what we've called workforce training was what we would say is that you know it was about specific work or job skills. And then we believe that there's something higher level and we call it education because it prepared people for life beyond work. But in fact, many, many of the things that we prepare people for in work are the same things we prepare them for in life. And yet we've tried in higher education for too long to say our primary role isn't to prepare people for jobs, it's to prepare them for life. We now understand, and again, COVID has put this exclamation point on it, that in preparing people for human work, training that's devoid of the broader learning that you get in education, nor education devoid of the preparation for work that people will, will, will need is what we should be thinking about. We should be thinking about these things together. And for us in higher education, what that means is that we've gotta be more deliberate about what our graduates know and can do with the degrees that, or, or other credentials that we issue. And so being very clear, whether it's you know, a bachelor's degree or an associate degree or a certificate or a certification or a master's or a PhD, we should be very clear about the learning that's associated with that. What, what you know and can do with that credential is really important. We have tremendous 
data and systems behind this. We have been working on this question of learning outcomes in higher education for close to three decades. Um, virtually my entire career, I've been engaged in these conversations about learning outcomes. And yet we are careful about being too precise about how they prepare people for specific jobs other than in fields that are, that are sort of the professional fields uh, for fear that somehow we are going to um, end up being accused of training people as opposed to educating them. So, so I think we have to get, get around that false dichotomy in a, in a very important way. And then the other thing we need to take very seriously, I think coming out of COVID is who we are educating. And you know, you've know, you seen these calls now coming not only for dramatically increasing you know, that 50% of the population, increasing the education and, and, and knowledge of the people in that 50% of the population whose jobs are gonna be changing, but also educating much more diverse populations. And uh, you know, the, the racial injustice and inequity that we've seen in COVID, right? The higher death rates for African-Americans, particularly African-Americans and Latinos, the ways in which COVID has played out in terms of women in, in, this, um, um, in this pandemic. Um, these again are things that we saw before COVID, but have now been um, accented and highlighted in ways uh, that will force us, I think, uh, to be much clearer about what we're doing in, in, this, in the system of higher education. So, you know, to me, I wanna make sure that we in higher education take seriously this opportunity to literally educate more people better when it comes to what we're doing in higher education. And, you know, our system of, of, of higher education has always been the engine of economic and social progress um, um, in, in not only in the US, but around the world. We need to seize that now and actually fulfill that goal because society is demanding it. I can't tell you how many times I've, uh, I've, I've been in circles in higher education where I heard the, uh, the false argument that you, that you presented, uh, that universities are not here uh, to be job training sites. Um, and, um, and I've always felt the way you felt is that I didn't even want to defend that because it's a false argument. You know, the, 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 the two can be true at the same time, that they can be uh, um, uh, preparation sites for the work, for the future of work, but at the same time that there are education sites, especially for a generation of knowledge and of research and of uh, um, uh, expanding mindsets and um, um, educating, educating global citizens of the world. That, you can that's right. Work. And, you know, the, the irony of all this is that as we move more and more into this human work ecosystem, what we've said we're always good at in higher education is what people will need more and more than ever, right? So you, yes, you need to know something about chemistry or graphic design or, or whatever it may be. But increasingly what employers say they need is they need people who are critical thinkers and problem solvers and good communicators. These are the things that we've long said are, are important outcomes of, of what, we, what we produced. That's what we wanna prepare people for. You know, I, I, I push back when people refer to those things as the soft skills. Those aren't the soft skills, those are the durable skills. Those are the things that matter long-term when it comes to work. And that's what we've at least said in higher education, we're always good at. So to me, our degrees, our credentials should represent that combination of generalizable skills and, and abilities and content specific knowledge um, and abilities. To Bringing those together, I think will be extremely important as we think about the future of higher education. Don't you think that the pressure for enrollment, especially now, because this is, I think, I feel like this has been the first time I felt closer as a higher education person, as a felt closer um, in, in our industry to the tipping point for higher education. That, and it's because of the enrollment pressure that, don't you think that the enrollment pressure would finally start to change that narrative uh, on college campuses? And, um, I, I think there's going to be an interesting, um, we are again at a point where there's a fairly complex set of things all coming together. You know, on, on the one hand, I think um, demand for talent is rising. There is no question about that, right? That the demand for higher levels of skills and knowledge and abilities is growing. Um, if you want just one data point, um, I mentioned this on social media a few days ago, because it, it really is a sort of extraordinary thing. 
in March of this year, there were 916,000 new jobs created in the American economy. And of those 916,000 new jobs, 7,000, less than 1%, went to people with a high school credential or less. All of the rest of those new jobs went to people who had a post-secondary credential. Mm -hmm. So to me, that is the clearest evidence that from the labor market perspective, from the employer perspective, they are voting with their feet and saying, we will hire the people who have the, this developed talent that you can show through the credential. But the employers are also saying another thing that we've got to pay attention to, which is that they are not satisfied with that as the proxy. And you see some of these large employers, Google, um, Accenture, others, now saying that they are um, uh, willing to hire for skills, not simply degrees. What they mean by that is that the degree to them is no longer an adequate proxy. What yeah. they want is what's what people know and can do when they come to them as, as, a, as a prospective employee. And I think it's our responsibility in higher education to be clearer about that. Again, to help them not only be successful in work, but to help them be successful in life. Well, then the biggest signal of that is, uh, are these uh, certificates that are coming out of these companies themselves. I mean, Google just created a uh, work certificate program, and they're getting into the, uh, this education business, which, is, uh, uh, which has been written about as a projection or as a prediction for a long time. I mm -hmm. mean, I can tell you that I have run into a lot of companies that were having their own pro boot camps, if you will, for new college graduates that they've hired. To, and, and run them through these three or six months boot camps to upskill them. And that always told me that we that there was a, a gap between universities and, and education. So now they're formalizing it. Google has done that. There are other companies that are doing that. So that's that, that that's really fascinating that there are now these these different agents that are that are coming into it. And and you talk I think by the way, there's an opportunity there for higher education, don't you? Because for higher education, the opportunity is that we can become the agents of, of that work, right? So right now the employers are doing it themselves because they are frustrated that higher education isn't doing that. But if we sort of see this as an opportunity for us not to get students once, but to get them many times over the course of their working lifetime as work changes and as we need to continue to develop the talents of, of the developed talents of these individuals. So, you know, again, uh, we, we've sort of got to break this cycle. Uh, the system is predicated on this idea that the best way you go through life is you learn first and then you work second. But the reality now is that that learning part has to take place all the way through your work career. So why, why wouldn't we see ourselves as an ongoing part of that, not just in terms of what people call adult learning, right? That's a very important part, particularly now in this, in this post-COVID environment, but as an ongoing part of what we're doing, why not have the same people come back to Hopkins three, four, 10 times in their life because they need that next level. They need that next certification. They need that certificate. They need that, that whatever those credentials that we'll call in the future might be to help them advance either in their current job or the next job or whatever the work is that they're doing. To me, there's an opportunity for higher education that is actually a growth opportunity. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that that concept is that actually referred to as the open loop university, right. uh, which is a concept and you know, it might have been experimented with in, in some places, but I think it has potential um, to, to play out in a, um, at, at a bigger scale. Um, I think also we could learn from the lessons we, uh, uh, we've had with Coursera, for example, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the MOOCs uh, uh, environment, uh, because universities, you're right, can be the nurturing environment for knowledge uh, production and for uh, uh, scholarly work and for skill development. Um, but it doesn't always have to be the delivery mechanism too. So I think that that the industry higher education partnership can, can play a big role here. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, I, uh, you, uh, you probably watched uh, the state of the union yesterday with president uh, uh, Biden. Um, and he talked a little bit about um, the infrastructure bill. Um, and as I was listening to that and trying to look further into it, what I'm what I'm hearing also is jobs and jobs for maybe certain categories of the population um, and uh, creating an economic engine, if you will, that um, uh, will help us out of maybe this past recession. 
Um, what what are your predictions there and what are your projections? What, what do you think will happen if this bill passes? I started working uh, in this field in the in the mid 80s, Farouk, and um, I, um, I, I started my career as a policy analyst in Washington, D.C., spent two decades of my life in Washington working on federal policy, as well as a variety of other things. I worked on on higher education policy in other parts of the world and in the states, et cetera. But I did a lot at the federal level. Um, I'm describing 2021 as the 100 year flood when it comes to this, <laughs> this, this work, because the numbers that we are talking about between uh, the um, uh, what they call the American Jobs Plan in, in March and now the American Families Plan that they announced yesterday is astronomical, right? So the, the, the combined costs of these things are $1.8 trillion, of which about 800 billion is actually tax related. So it's a, a trillion dollars in actual new spending. And if you look at the dollars associated with this, this these are eye popping numbers, right? Over a hundred billion dollars for tuition and, and uh, um, or, or uh, you know, tuition free community college, the two year college, um, big investments in HBCUs and tribal colleges and Hispanic serving institutions, massive increase of the Pell Grant, $1,400 increase. Um, and huge subsidies in, in a variety of, of, of other ways. These dollars are dollars that are unprecedented. And I think there, it creates an opportunity, an oppor maybe a once, in a once in a generation opportunity to think about the federal government as a partner in this development of the new human work um, ecosystem. There's a risk, of course. The risk is that we will do what we did in 2008, 2010, which is that the federal money flowed to the states and to institutions and to other partners and was more often than not used to backfill for resources that had been lost in the economic crisis. Uh, in other words, making them whole as opposed to investing in the large scale change and innovation that's needed. We can't make that mistake this time around. So if we are going to make community college free, which I think is a powerful idea, we need to make sure that it is targeted on ensuring that people are prepared coming out of those community college programs, either for really good work right then and there, or they're on a pathway, a clear pathway to their next credential so that they can gain the higher level of skills and keep going. But if we're going to invest in things that are not leading to those kind of opportunities, we will simply be backfilling for the underperformance of what we've seen in the current system and miss, I think, this once in a generation opportunity. So uh, I also think there's enormous responsibility on the part of the colleges and universities, the states, and even us in philanthropy to take seriously this, um, this a unique federal investment. We've got to make sure that we leverage that for large scale change and look at these dollars as transformative, not simply uh, restorative. Um, and that tr transformative opportunity, I think, for us in philanthropy is going to mean that, you know, we need to take risk, a higher level of risk than others. We've always done this in philanthropy, right? Our job in philanthropy should always be to take risks that others can't take, but to take risk that is not possible simply with these federal dollars. And, and you know, we, we see it at Lumina Foundation as a huge challenge, but also a huge opportunity. It means that we can focus more now on the bigger bets, the bigger change, the, you know, the, 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 the innovations that can lead to, to large scale change because our resources, um, our, our resources have always been small compared to government dollars, but our resources are now much smaller than government dollars, but our ability to leverage large scale change has increased because we can take that risk. Now you're getting me all curious now, what's an example of, that, of something that's big and bold and uh, involves a lot of risk that can only happen with, uh, uh, with a shot of money like this, uh, whether it's Lumina Foundation or just in education or higher education in general? You know, part of what we've tried to develop is ideas that have scalable potential, right? So we are system change oriented. You know our story. We've been focused since 2008 on this idea that 60% of Americans should have a high quality degree, certificate or other credential by 2025. Since we started, that percentage went from 38% to 52%. 12 million more Americans have a degree certificate or certification than, than when we started. So that, that's real progress. By the way, we won't make 60% based on the rate of progress that we've achieved up until this point, which means we need to do even more. 
And part of what we can do that the federal money just can't uh, contribute to is to help people understand where the gaps are in that system. So for example, one of the things that we've seen that is a, a deterrent, particularly to adults and to first generation learners is that it takes too long to get the first credential, right? And so you need a reward system, a ratcheting. So we've been developing these, well, we call them credential as you go initiatives where people can get a credential on the pathway to the associate degree or the bachelor's degree or what, whatever it may be that has real labor market value that will allow the individuals to continue learning, right? So the government money can be used to support the tuition costs, et cetera. We can help the institutions develop these credential as you go programs. We can help the institutions focus on their racial justice and equity programs in a way that the federal, federal money is too blunt of an instrument to be able to do. You know, we can help uh, the, the colleges and universities or the workforce agencies or the other providers of, of learning you know, develop these, uh, these new innovations that bring technology and learning together in these hybrid learning environments that we were talking about earlier in ways that the government money is simply, the government money is obviously mostly targeted on providing serious financial relief, particularly to the lowest income um, uh, learners. And to me, that's money well spent from a federal perspective, but it doesn't solve the combination of factors that we have in, in the system. The th I call it the three-legged stool, Farouk, of financial, academic, and social barriers that individuals face when they, when they come to our colleges and universities. We can concentrate more now in Lumina on what those social barriers are, what those academic barriers are, and help provide the glue that links up with the, with the financial barriers that hopefully the federal government will help, will help address. I uh, have always believed that scale and scalable solutions are the fastest way to equity um, more than any um, um, a precise and, uh, and direct shot to um, uh, supporting uh, one community in particular. And those are important solutions, but I think the biggest and the fastest way to, to, to get there to equity is, uh, is to, to, to create things in scale that can be, that can improve access in um, uh, uh, experience and in opportunities, but also uh, um, in outcomes, that there is equity in outcomes too. So I love that the, the bold uh, idea involves a scalable solution there. Um, I, uh, I wanna use this to uh, circle back to a conversation that uh, you started having earlier that's really important. And that's about social justice in this country. And it certainly involves equity and we see these inequities in every uh, corner of our society. Um, we, uh, uh, but it also involves um, uh, prejudice and um, uh, the fight against prejudice and um, um, uh, having uh, compositional diversity in all uh, lev levels of organizations. And there is a real conversation now as a result of what has happened in the last 12 months. Um, I think what I, you, you, being stuck in our homes for many of us has forced us to sit and watch all these videos and really come to terms with the um, injustice that's happening in this country and in this world. Um, how do we move forward? Uh, a verdict in a trial is not going to solve this. Um, we know that there are systematic inequities um, in, in all of our organizations, in the workplace, in education, um, in uh, our policies, uh, and we know that there is a lot of change that needs to happen um, in order to get to uh, a, a more equitable um, and just society. It's a complex question that <laughs> that probably requires a lot more than than one vision chats. But I'd love to tackle that a little bit with you as we think about the future. Of it's a it's a it's a really important um, dimension of defining who we are. In fact, you know, I I think. Um, I describe racial injustice as an existential threat. Um, I believe that if we don't address racial injustice, that it, it's a threat to us, uh, to, to humanity, in the same way that climate change is a threat, in the same way that I think authoritarianism is a threat. I believe racial injustice is a threat to our collective well being. Um, you know, we have to start by acknowledging that systems and processes. Um, and policies that go back hundreds of years have been specifically designed to disadvantage people of color. 
Uh, we have to acknowledge that 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 is a part of our of our of our history, and um, the the legacy and contemporary way in which we we live as a society is that those systems exist today. Acknowledging that though isn't enough. I think it is understanding what we do to reduce and eliminate those those inequities and, and injustices um, along the way. And um, you know, I've actually been focused on this idea that. You need to put equity first in all that you do. In fact, Lumina Foundation, we call, we describe our new uh, strategic plan as an equity first strategic plan because we believe powerfully that you've got to focus on racial justice as the first part of what you're focusing on. But the key to this is what um, Heather McGee in her new book, The Sum of Us, tries to articulate, which is that we have to come to a realization that as a society, racial injustice is not about somebody else. It's about all of us and that our strategies at the end of the day have to be positioned so that they lift up African-Americans, Latinos, Native Americans in ways that give them disproportionate opportunity in a system that has been disproportionately positioned against them, but that creates opportunities for everyone to increase. So it's not quite the rising tide lifts all boats argument uh, because a rising tide lifts all boats means that you leave the people who are behind further behind uh, or, or as far behind as, as they were before. But the mm. point is that we've got to invest in strategies that do have broad impact as well as strategies that are targeted on uh, populations that have faced this, this racial injustice. And that applies in education, it applies in employment, it implies in, in housing, you know, wh whatever the, the, the area may be, you know, I think it's, uh, that's really important. Um, you know, Lumina Foundation is focused exclusively on post high school learning. But, you know, one of the things that we've tried to think about from our um, impact investing perspective is how we can contribute to uh, racial equity, not simply by investing in education strategies, uh, that will that will um, uh, reduce these these gaps in in, in attainment for African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans, but also do things like increase um, African American wealth in this country, because mm -hmm. the wealth disparity is part of why we have uh, gaps in terms of 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 our our you know societal well being. Um, you know, you look at the ways in which you know even here's the data point that I, I point out to people. Um, even for African Americans who have a bachelor's degree, their ability to borrow money um, as entrepreneurs and their ability to, um, you know, uh, participate in things like the housing market is disadvantaged because of racial discrimination. So we have to eliminate those barriers to create opportunities for more wealth generation, more opportunities for equality in terms of housing and other things as part of this, this work. And again, it's not because it's the right thing to do for African Americans. It's because it's in our collective well-being to do that. That, to me, is the key. So it's a both-and strategy from my perspective. And and uh, I hope everybody will read my book. But I hope you'll also read Heather McGee's book, The Some of Us, because I think it's really, really well done. I want to re recommend one more book uh, to, to that great list. Uh, you might be familiar with it, Jamie. Um, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi. Absolutely. Um, just talking about it yesterday at Lumina Foundation. <laughs> Did you? Okay, that's great. Well, you know, um, your strategy is just that. I mean, the what you're doing at the Lumina Foundation is exactly what the book is about, uh, is how to be an anti-racist is to proactively uh, dismantle and fight systems of uh, uh, racism and of prejudice that uh, benefit the few uh, at the expense of uh, of the underrepresented and under underprivileged, and um, you're doing that. So I think uh, that that's a book that I recommend to uh, to, to everyone. I want to share with you a story of what we're, we've been doing at Johns Hopkins uh, for the last several years since I joined. Um, so my my area is responsible for producing life and career outcomes for students. So that's, that is what, what are the metric that we live by. But um, in our visioning process early on, we change that to, we're not necessarily looking at what our graduates at Johns Hopkins are doing a year out, five years out, 10 years out. We're looking at the gaps uh, between the haves and have nots among our graduate students. And uh, for the first time, we really started to look into those. So that pushed us, you know, just this is a way of how like, when you look at your systems in a different way uh, and then you build your dashboards based on that, 
um, it starts to change even your practices. So for example, we started to see that there are gaps between um, our uh, Pell Grant graduates versus our non-Pell Grant graduates. So in the level of uh, income that they come from has an impact on that. But there are gaps between our first generation college students versus not. Uh, in the type of opportunities they attain, the type of salaries that they gain, uh, where they go, how long it takes them to get there. And we started to see gaps between all these categories, not only in terms of outcomes, but also in terms of their engagement in the things that in the transformative experiences mm. that they participate in during college. Those are internships, there are mentoring connections, there are uh, studying abroad, for example, the different experiences that form a college student that are part of that college admission brochure um, that uh, uh, we entice students with. And they come in and you have a group of students who take advantage of all of those resources and another group of students who miss out on it. That's and right. we're starting to see those gaps. So this is just to offer another example of how this is how how we can fight systems of racism. So I truly appreciate the the example you you gave here is that we can all just make a difference if we have a um, an honest look at our own systems and be willing to dismantle certain structures and then rebuild them uh, to benefit um, all rather than uh, uh, just the privileged few. Um, you know, there's a there's an issue here of of you know what people have long called reproduction of privilege. That's really true, right? Which is that. So for for whites, you know, a higher proportion of white people in America, almost twice um, uh, the level, have a bachelor's degree compared to African Americans and, and Latinos. So when you then get to the next generation, well, what do you have? So then you have parents who have college degrees, who understand how to navigate the system that, you know, you were talking about those first generation learners face many challenges. They know how to navigate it. So their privilege gets transmitted to their kids uh, and um, they have more opportunities in that, in, in that system. So you can't create a level playing field if that privilege keeps getting re reproduced, right? It, it's simply not possible. I was a first generation learner. Uh, I'm a white male but I was a first generation learner. I know what the barriers were that I faced. My, my parents were immigrants. My parents didn't know what college was except for one thing. And that was, we were going and that was all they knew. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was fortunate that I had the motivation of my parents, even though they didn't understand it, but I showed up for my freshman year of college with absolutely no knowledge of what I was supposed to do. In fact, I had never visited the campus before I showed up as a college freshman, Bates College in Maine. Nobody told me you're supposed to visit the college before you, before you, uh, before you uh, get accepted and go. I just applied and got in and I showed up as a freshman. And so, you know, it was scary. It was frightening. And I had to navigate the system largely on my own. Well, mm -hmm. this is what first generation learners deal with every day and have ever since I went to college in the early 1980s. And then you add to that that you are Latino, that you are African American, that you are Native American, that you're dealing with these 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 challenges. You're an you're an immigrant. Uh, you are someone who is LGBTQ plus. You know whatever it may be, these factors have to be taken into account, and we need to compensate for them to ensure that our policies and strategies are actually meeting where the, those students where they are. At the end of the day, I, I like to describe myself, Farouk, as uh, I was lucky. Um, I I went to a school that understood my experience. But I also had good mentors, good friends, good teachers that guided me through that process. Luck is a terrible societal strategy, <laughs> terrible yeah. societal strategy. We actually need to be systematic uh, about this in order to succeed. That's why, why scale is so important. You know, that, that, that's why I don't think I think we see a lot of universities. I can tell you that. Um, 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 add a lot of additional resources to help first generation students specifically and limited income and underrepresented minorities. And those are good solutions. I don't certainly, uh, uh, I'm not trying to say that those should be removed, but I think the best solution is to look at the systems themselves and rebuild them using kind of like strategies of universal design for learning, you know, that go and 
try to build something that is for all, regardless of background or social capital, you shouldn't miss it. I use often the analogy of the um, um, of uh, the attraction park that you go to and everyone pays the same uh, uh, admission ticket, but and some kids will have a grand time and will not miss out on some of the big roller coasters and the rides, et cetera, because they know how to navigate it. They're going with people who know what to do. And then you have others who've never been and are all alone and they're looking at this confusing map and they might just get a ride or two and, right. and get out for the same price. So that's a, the best analogy I get to, to, to use for that. You know, in, in the time that we have left, I'd love to uh, tackle the um, uh, future of philanthropy. Um, your world must have been impacted um, uh, this last year, either positively or negatively. I'm sure that there are opportunities that you've discovered, but also there are some challenges. Um, how is this changing and where do you see the philanthropy going in the future um, as we, uh, we, we build a new normal post-COVID-19? I'm part of these um, regular meetings among um, CEOs of large foundations. And we, we had one of these meetings just, just this week. And uh, I said to, to my colleagues and some of these other large foundations, you know, I treat these conversations now like group therapy. Um, we've all been through an extraordinary year. And, uh, you know, on the, on the one hand, I'm really proud of philanthropy and the way that it has risen to the challenges of the last um, year, particularly when, the way I've seen um, many foundations that were not as focused on racial justice and equity become more focused on it um, as a result of the murder of George Floyd and, and so many others. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's a, a really good thing uh, from a philanthropic perspective. But I also keep asking this question um, for us at Lumina Foundation and for all of us in philanthropy. I'm the immediate past chair of the Council on Foundation. So I think a lot about the role of, of, of philanthropy. Are we doing enough? Can we do more? And if so, what is it? You know, the easy answer that people suggest is, well, you should allocate more money. But I'm not sure that money is actually the most important part of our toolbox. Obviously, we have resources and we can deploy it. But if you look at philanthropic capital and compare it to, say, government capital or private capital market capital, right? So American philanthropy um, in, in its totality, if you took not just... Um, not just the grant making, but the entire assets of American philanthropy, it represents less than 1% of the value of private capital markets, uh, of, the, uh, you know, of, the, of the market value of private capital markets. So um, our money um, gives us opportunity to do certain things, but our money is not going to solve these problems. So what, what will? And you know, it comes back first to, to the thing I said to you earlier, we need to think very seriously about whether we are taking enough risk in philanthropy, right? And so has the last year shown us that, um, you know, whether it is what people are pushing us, which is to go beyond the 5% payout, which um, Lumina has done actually for my entire tenure, we've never been uh, limited to 5% to payout. Our board every year has said, tell us what you need. And they've, and they've approved it. So we, we've, we've spent well above 5% now at Lumina for, for, for many years. But taking risk entails investing in ideas, in organizations, in strategies that others won't take risk on, right? Maybe, you know, to my point earlier, because, you know, we're not accountable to vote voters or share shareholders the way government or the public companies might be, but we've got to take that risk that I think um, others can't or won't. Um, I also think that philanthropy has got to keep its focus on the long view, um, it is harder, again, when you're running for office or when you're trying to meet um, quarterly uh, earnings expectations to focus on long-term uh, results. Philanthropy needs to do that, right? So in, in, in philanthropy, our best capital is deployed when it's patient capital, when it's actually focused on achieving long-term success over an extended period of time. I actually have made this argument in writing before that in my mind, I distinguish between philanthropy and charity. Um, though we are called charitable organizations from a legal, legal perspective, philanthropy is about taking risk. And it is also about being systemic, being focused on long-term change. 
And whereas charity is about meeting immediate needs, about serving the needs of individuals in a shorter cycle, both are terribly important in American society. But I think we need to be focused even more on, on that long-term change. And to come back to something I said earlier, that includes philanthropy taking more risk when it comes to these existential risks that society faces. Uh, racial injustice, climate change, um, authoritarianism. And then the question that I raise in my book, which is, is artificial intelligence an existential risk or not? I think in the case of artificial intelligence, my answer is it depends on what we do to prepare ourselves, right? If, if we treat it as a complementary uh, a compliment to us as humans, then it is not a risk. But if we treat it as a threat, I think it won't be. And, you know, I also think, you know, last point here is that we have to do a better job of coordinating among those we work with in helping them achieve the outcomes that they're, they're trying to, to achieve. Uh, one of the problems that you have in philanthropy is, and we'll look specifically at the space of what Lumina does, post high school learning philanthropy. There are lots of terrific organizations out there, the Gates Foundation, the Kresge Foundation, Ascendium, you know, many, many funders focused on similar things to what we are doing. But we need to do a better job of collaborating, not only across those philanthropic organizations, but collaborating at the level of our grantees and partners so that we literally can help them achieve greater outcomes. The sum really does have to be greater than the parts when it comes to our, our investments, whether they are grants, whether they are in capacity building, or whether they are in those impact investments where we're trying to leverage our, our endowment for even larger scale change. You know, I've always wondered also um, how people in your seat manage the risk of uh, having to stand up as a, an organization for particular social justice issues that might be controversial and that might cost you donors. Um, I wonder if you could speak to that because it's, it's always been a question for me, for universities especially, uh, but also for, uh, for nonprofit organizations and frankly also for, for companies uh, be, because they might, they might not cost them donors, but it might cost them uh, the, uh, a change in, the, in their stock price too. Um, how do you manage that? And, it's, and, and as we move forward here, there's going to be more and more of these issues and um, uh, the time when these things happen, it might the standing up for these issues might not be the most popular thing. Um, f- yeah, you know, there's a um, American philanthropy is really complex and and diverse in a good way, I think. And so, you know, when we talk about philanthropy, there's different buckets of these these philanthropic organizations, right? So there's community based foundations, which are really important communities. They tend to be those kind of fundraising organizations you're talking about, right? Where they're trying to raise resources. They do what colleges and universities do, right? They raise resources and then they allocate them for for mission, for purpose, whatever they're trying to do are really important. There's obviously corporate foundations, usually part of the CSR function of of, of the corporation that are trying to achieve social impact with their money, often in areas that align with their business interests or communities where they're working, et cetera. Um, and then you've got the family foundations and the private foundations like Lumina. In Lumina's case, we're wholly endowed. So we're not doing any fundraising, which means we are truly independent, right? So we have an endowment. We invest the endowment resources and we use the resources to, to try to leverage, as we talked about earlier, systemic change. For these kind of foundations, as well as for the family foundations that are endowed by, by, by families, but, uh, but the, um, the, the resources are being allocated to to sort of really high mission-driven purposes, it's really important from my perspective that we focus those, those resources on taking that, that risk that others can't take. Because you're right, we live in a very uh, stratified, bifurcated, you know, split um, uh, nation. And there are lots of things for which um, the investment of capital might raise eyebrows, might, might raise questions. Um, so we've, we've got to take that risk that others won't take. I will, I will make an argument, however, that even for all of the rest of those societal entities, universities included, we've got to be clear about what we stand for and what we are about. And at the end of the day, you know, do we believe that racial injustice is an existential threat? If we do, then we should invest in it. Do we believe that climate change is an existential threat? If we do, then we should invest in it. Um, you know, you have to, at the end of the day, as mission-driven uh, organizations, 
stand for something. And to me, um, that's true for NGOs, it's true for colleges and universities, it's true for corporations that um, you can do well and do good, but you have to be really clear about who you are and what your goals are. I love that clarity of mission and values and uh, so appreciate everything that you've shared today. Um, can you take us back as a last question to your college days and maybe soon after that, what were some of the pivotal moments uh, that you had in your early career um, as, a, as a young adult um, to, that, that led you to where you are today? Yeah, you know, my, my story is not unique, but, um, I, you know, again, I've, I've described myself as a person who's lived a career of, of good fortune because, you know, I, I was that first generation learner um, at Bates College in Maine. Um, I, um, during my collegiate career, uh, decided I would focus on public policy and political science. So I ended up going to Washington DC every summer and doing internships and doing that. I saw somebody in the chat talking about experiential learning, a huge believer. I think it's ex extremely, extremely important. Um, and, um, and then went to Washington DC looking for a job in public policy and happened to land in education policy. Like that, that just sort of, I was, you know, I was like any 22 year old, I was sort of, I wanted a job. I wanted to get connected to my career and get going. And I was actually working for in the Washington office of the college board. And, and I was there a few months before I realized that I was doing research about people like me. I was doing research on financial aid. You know, I was a walking advertisement for every financial aid program. I'm a Pell Grant recipient, a student loan recipient, a work study recipient. You know, I, I had a job on campus. I had a job off campus. I, I my church gave me money, my, my local community scholarship foundation. You know, I, I, I had all that support. And it was at that moment I realized that um, I wanted to focus my career on helping a lot more people achieve the success that I was able to achieve because of what I had gotten out of my experience at Bates. And that's what I set out to do. So I, you know, as I, uh, you mentioned at the, at the top, I, I um, ended up um, co-founding the Institute for Higher Education Policy in, in Washington, D.C. with Colleen O'Brien. Um, I ended up um, at uh, Lumina Foundation in 2008 um, and uh, feel like uh, my, my mission, my career has been to advance high quality post high school learning, particularly for those who have not had the opportunities to do so, because I believe at the end of the day that our collective well-being is premised on increasing talent so that we can all um, enjoy the benefits of what talented people bring to our, to our shared prosperity. Fascinating. And uh, uh, Jamie, you're a walking inspiration. So th thank you so much for all of the good that you do out there and for um, the thought leadership and for uh, inspiring all of us with uh, the work that you do personally, but also for the work that the Lumina Foundation uh, does. Uh, so appreciate it. I hope we'll get to reconnect again in the future. I want to thank all of our audience for being with us today. And uh, remember that the only vision that matters is the one that you create. Thank you all so much and blessings to all.